Hey guys, first episode of a new format on the Nicholas Engel experience, and it's called Coffee and Conversations with Champions. We've been running this with great success on the Emmet Media channel, where we are focusing on ordinary people and super stars performing exceptionally well in the sporting arena. We're covering topics like powerlifting, swimming, and we're going to be bringing in other sports. I wanted to roll this out on my show because of the success of this format on the Emmet Media channel. And I wanted to start to interview other individuals from ordinary backgrounds doing extraordinary things. So welcome to episode one of Coffee and Conversations with Champions on the Nicholas Engel experience. Okay. Miles, um, tell us about the project and the program. So, yeah, Welcome. so um, I'm uh, currently the um, communications and fundraising manager for an organization called Protect the West Coast, which is an NPO. It was formed in 2020 by a, a guy called Mike Slebach, who's the managing director. And he um, he's a, quite a well-known big wave surfer, one of the more prominent guys out of Dungeons uh, here in Hart Bay. Okay, for, so for proper big proper big now. waves. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's one of the sort of elite of the the big wave crew. And right. um, he uh, he went surfing um, up up the west coast, you know, way past Dillon's Bay, like uh, you know, towards uh, the Namaqualand. There's mm -hmm. a couple of spots up there, a couple of little areas that are you know got really good good surf. Some some you know that can handle quite big swells, and he went up there and um, he went to this one you know spot and uh, down this dirt road and got got blocked by these miners. that told him no, you can't go down the down there. Um, right. It's a prohibited area. And he started will, will digging you give around. Me one sec, sorry, they're just sweeping yeah. outside. I'm going to close the window. Right. Give me a sec. Sorry. Always good to edit in post. <laughs> so, sorry. So you're saying he was stopped by the miners? Yeah. And um, yeah, I did some digging and, and found out now this is a, a company called MSR, Australian uh, Mining Company, or subsidiary of an Australian mining company that, uh, excuse me, uh, obtained. They already had a mine there that was as, as legal as, you know, it, it seems uh, on mm -hmm. the surface of it. But um, they... Um, the subsequently, the mergers now they obtained uh, permission to mine what they call a ten beach extension, which is another section next to the mine they already had. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some sort of irregularities or question marks about how that was happened, at how that happened. And uh, yeah, so he, you know, got got to be in his bonnets and, and formed um, Protect the West Coast, yeah. which well, is what know, is the mining that they do. So you know, traditionally they've been mining up all up the west coast all the way to namibia into namibia for diamonds okay and um what's emerged you know is is the sands of the west coast and then particularly on, on the beaches and you know sort of going a bit, a bit inland um this from north of Irlands, the Irlands area Irlands bay area is a place called sunfelt mm -hmm. you go up there it's like being on the beach but you, you're not near the, the coast you know Apparently, the, uh, uh, the, the the ocean used to lap at the foothills of the Cedarberg Mountains many years ago. Sure. And that actually, why the West Coast Road is the way it is, the R27, is because mm -hmm. it follows the beach. Right. At the time, uh, which is quite interesting. Sure. But, um, yeah, so they um, they mine for these, these minerals, uh, uh, zirconium. A lot of them are used in um, uh, uh, electronics applications. Um, there's minerals that they use to put in toothpaste. Um, it's a whole lot of, you know, there's a long list of very sort of scientific, you know, but that, that, mm -hmm. the, these um, heavy minerals, they're called. Right. And so the, the mining that they do is, is basically they dig up the beach and filter the sand and, and get these minerals um, out of the sand, extract them and process them and ship them off to sell around the world. So that's the, the sort of bottom line. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of them. If, if you want a full detail of all the, all the yeah. different minerals that they they mine i can give you a little bit more background let me just yeah. google it we, we, we can run through it. that or we can put it sort of in the comments if that's easier for you we can put a document uh, through yeah let me just call up um 
All right, awesome. I'm actually going to our, our website. And one of what, my, my yeah, top, yeah. yeah, sorry, one of, one of, one of my tasks uh, as, as the communications manager of the company mm. is, I mean, of the, of the organization is to come up with talking points for the media. <laughs> okay, I haven't quite got there yet. Okay, I actually well, joined. Yeah. I actually joined the organization um, just after its inception and then um, worked for them for about 18 months, a little longer. And then my, my mom passed away, so I had to sort of step aside and deal with all of that stuff. And um, yeah, I just recently rejoined, so I'm sort of still, that was about uh, six weeks ago, so I'm still sort of catching up on... Um, on everything, but uh, yeah, sort of the tasks with uh, um, all the communications, um, media, media work, as well as you know getting involved on the fundraising side, to uh, just to raise funds so we can continue our our work. Right. What What is the damage that's being done? You're talking about filtering all of the beach sand. I'm sure that's quite destructive for the wildlife that's living in there. The your crabs and your little creatures and oh, stuff. look, there's there's you know the west coast. One area under threat, for example, is the Ulefonts Estuary, which is um, mm. near Papendorp. Um, and that that area is, I think, is uh, the second most biodiverse uh, area in South Africa. The biodiversity is just incredible up there. And, you know, every kind of um, fauna and flora that's in the ecosystem is threatened by this, by this uh, mining. It's a particularly um, dis destructive, disruptive type of... Um, mining it's not like they dig a hole and go deep into the ground and sort of out of sight mm. uh, out of sight out of mind uh they they basically dig it's like a giant toddler has gone crazy with the in the sand pit you know it's just um they dig these holes and uh you know put all the sand that 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 they filtered in, in these big mm. sort of mine dumps and um they really just carve up the whole landscape um and it just looks like a moonscape afterwards um so they're supposed to rehabilitate the 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 um, each each mine, right? That, that was but, my next question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, technically, they're supposed to, but you know, uh, and we, we we can't. You know, to protect the West Coast is not not anti mining per se. Mm. Um, it it needs to be. It's, it's quite poorly regulated, and um, you know, corners are cut and promises are made. And so it's, I'm not painting all the mining companies that have been up there mm. the, the whole time, or even the ones that are up there at the moment with the same brush. But there certainly are some cowboys that um, don't, you know, don't follow the rules. Right. Is that and because it's quite a remote area, so it's difficult to it police? It is, and, and this is, you know, this is kind of the crux of the matter. Is for the guys have got away with 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 this for so long because mm. the West Coast is, you know, if you include Namibia, um, mm -hmm. but that region is the most sparsely populated populated real estate on planet mm -hmm. earth i think it's three people three people to every thousand square kilometers or something it's it's you know you, do, you go one step further on and you mm -hmm. in desert where no one lives you know right that's, that's basically the line so it is extremely sparsely populated and yeah it's been out of sight out of mind for for decades mm -hmm. but now what's happening is with technology you know people are much more connected than they used to be and also the, the, the region is opening up, you know, the, the, um, and it's part, in part thanks to technology, but also, you know, tourism is, is growing up there. So more people are going up there and, and, and seeing, and particularly, you know, historically, uh, surfers are um, kind of pioneers in, in travel exploration. 100%. We, Endless you know, summer. We, there you go. Exactly. That's what yeah. it, I mean. And that was going on before that even, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, where you know some of the guys that are the first backpackers is a guy called Vic Metz, mm -hmm. who actually was uh, the catalyst. Uh, he met John Whitmore back in the day and, and kickstarted John Whitmore's whole program. Oh. He was friends with Hobie Alta. He was you know probably one of the first backpackers, surf travelers in the world, traveling around the world in the in the late fifties and early sixties. Um, so you know the, the, the surfers are the are the ones that have kind of um, explored all these areas looking for surf. I mean, there are other sort of uh, subcultures that also, mm. you know, head out into the remote areas. Um, the runners, uh, which I'll talk mm -hmm. about in a minute, because the running community has been very supportive of what we're doing. And um, obviously the divers, um, the divers, you know, the diamond divers are kind of caught between a, a rock and a hard place. They're, um, most of them are surfers, a lot of them, 
um, and so that's their livelihood. A lot of them are small operators, and so they, you know, have sided with us because they've seen mm. it firsthand. And so what's happened is this: these lines of communication have opened up between between you know the concerned sort of Cape Town surfers who go up there and and and, and surf a lot. And I mean that region's been surfed by like Kelly Slater, John John Florence, like all these world champions have been up there. Sure. Uh, Twiggy Baker's um, actually on our, our board of directors, um, big wave world champion from Durban. And uh, so they've over the years seen how this mining, this kind of mining, has encroached further and further south. And um, you know it's it's then the local populations as well. And and one of the mandates of Protect the West Coast is to unite the people of the region and help them to communicate with each other, mm -hmm. um, because that's the other problem is they're all in these isolated little dorpies. They're not extremely uh, connected, you know. But now lately, obviously, everyone's got a mobile phone. And I think that's the other thing as well. You know, the, the, the reception is, is improving up there. It's still not great, but there's more towers going up. So people are able to communicate and, and kind of um, mobilize and organize um, in a way that they haven't been able to before. And people are realizing, oh, this is going on in your town too and in your town. You know, and it's like, okay, this is affecting everybody. Right. Um, and this, you know, so, so when you talk about mining on the West Coast, the environmental degradation and the lack of rehabilitation are two very important points from an ecological point of view. Mm. But what, are you, what are you seeing? I mean, in, in terms yeah. of that, sort of like the before and after pictures. Exactly. I mean, you go on our website and you'll see all our socials, yeah. you'll see, you know, pictures that guys have gone up there. I mean, you know, at, at some of them are at quite a bit of risk to their own sort of uh, freedom or, or safety to go and mm. fly drones over these places because it's, it's um, you know, in terms of the constitution, you're supposed to, as a, as a member of the public of South Africa, as a citizen of the country, have reasonable access to to the coastline. Mm. And and technically, you can get to the coast, but unfortunately, because these guys have got these licenses and they sort of um, they cite health health and safety as a reason that you can't go on there. So so you can go on there, but you have to wear a helmet and boots and you know apply and do all this stuff. Right. There's supposed to be public access, but there isn't. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of what triggered the formation of the of Protect the West Coast. But it's really not about sort of privileged surfers from the city mm. not having access to their favorite surf spots. That's, that's, you know, that was kind of the catalyst and the trigger for it. But really, you know, once, once we scratched the surface and, and really determined, like, what exactly is going on up here, we determined that, you know, a lot of these sites have um, cultural uh, San Khoi and Nama tribe um, middens and Mm -hmm. archaeological um, you know, sites that are being disrupted. They are disrupting the traditional kind of pulse of movement of the, of the indigenous population. They're blocking the artisanal fishermen from getting to the, to the coast. And um, oh. it's affecting tourism as well because, you know, people can't go to these regions or these areas. Mm. And uh, it's once they, you know, do whatever they want to do and leave and leave, you know, basically a, a tip behind, I mean, who wants to go and camp or do any kind of recreation mm. in a place that looks like a, a, like a, a moonscape that exploded, you know, like a bomb exploded on a moonscape, which is terrible. So, um, right. you know, that's, but really, you know, for me personally as well, you know, the population up there, there there's got to be a better way. And, and the mining companies, you know, when they criticize, they will say, oh, well, we provide jobs, we provide economic stimulus to the area. And also they support the community. But in many cases, it's um, the, there's only a few permanent jobs that are created. Mm -hmm. Most of the economic activity is the, they extract these minerals, put them in trucks and ship them away. And, and the local population don't benefit. Right. Um, they benefit in a in very small, small way. And then, you know, in terms of the sort of CSR outreach, um, also very minimal is done, you know, if you go and scratch the surface and look at what these, some of these mining companies who are operating in certain areas actually do for the local communities, it's, it's, it's almost nothing. So, you know, I think people there, the people that live up there, you know, for a while sort of bought into that narrative and sort of, well, we need the mining companies because it brings, you know, it brings mm. jobs and it brings economic activity to the region. But I think more and more they're starting to realize that's not really the case and also you know one of our focuses as an organization is to create uh, nature-based solutions yeah and ha provide uh, alternatives sustainable alternatives in terms of tourism and uh, recreational sports um, uh, and also um, 
we just uh, we just about to publish a story of these guys that have got um, algae farms up there, for example. Right. Okay. So there's a, a lot of um, opportunities, mm. um, and and for the the local people to for us to support them. You know, one of the right. projects we've got is we've got an educational project for one of the schools in one of the affected areas called Dorimbai, um, where we're getting involved in educating the um, the youth. Right. Uh, because obviously they're the future and, and they're the ones that are going to be handed the custodianship of, of the coast. Yes. And they need to they need to know what's going on, you know. Um, uh, mm. so, yeah. Sorry, so I think just just to touch on that point, you know, you, you spoke about surfers being, um, you know, sort of, you know, uh, fortunate surfers from the big city coming through. But I always think from what I know of the surfing culture, surfers always... They, they view themselves as custodians of the environment, as custodians for the next generation, for future generations. Were you mentioning that the mining is well and good in terms of saying it's creating employment, but what's it doing? What's it leaving behind for future generations? What are your concerns well, exactly. around that? Well, it's leaving, you know, if, if done correctly, um, mm -hmm. you know, there are cases, there are great examples of where, you know, mine, mine, mining is done according to the book and they go in there and they do what they need to do and they rehabilitate the um the, the environment but mm. in most cases what you know there is one one thing they do for example is they get the mining rights they, they do their mining and then um what they do is they when 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 they get to the end of the mine cycle they they divvy it up and they sell it to smaller operators mm -hmm. And some of these smaller operators then extract what they can out of the out of the land and then they declare bankruptcy and they and they fold and so right. then the rehabilitation part of the process, which bookends the end of it, doesn't happen because these guys have put their hands up in there and said, hey, we, we, can't, uh, we can't afford to do the rehabilitation. We've gone into receivership and, you know, that's, right. that's the end of it. So, and you know, that's part of, part of their sort of modus operandi in, in those cases. So the, the, all part of, that's all part of the plan, at, at your, your sense, in terms of? Yeah, I think in some know. cases, definitely, mm -hmm. or that's just the way it works out, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. pre premeditated or whether it just ends up that way. Um, unfortunately, that is, is part of the uh, part of the thing. And then, you know, mm -hmm. another thing that I'm sort of becoming enlightened with recently is that, you know, I, I spoke to a chief of the Nama, Nama um, tribe in, in that part of the world recently. And, and uh, you know, he's, he's um, a mine of information, like he's, he's just a walking encyclopedia, this guy. Right. And he told me about basically how, you know, from from the Dutch, from Jan van Riebeck, they used to mm -hmm. go up there and get when when the Cape um, the settlement, the uh, uh, Cape Town settlement ran out of cattle. They went up to the Nama tribe. They were very successful uh, cattle herders and started to trade for cattle with them. And that's actually how all the little many of the little dorps on the West Coast uh, originated as cattle stations, you know. OK. And then um, they all sorts of promises were made to them by by the Dutch and reneged upon, and mm -hmm. then um, the British took over, and same thing happened, and mm -hmm. then uh, the Nats took over, and same thing happened, and now the most recent government have also, you know, broken promises, um, uh, sort of treaties and agreements that were made. These people are the the, the natural custodians and, and sort of owners mm -hmm. of the land, and uh, they've just been pushed aside for for profit, you know, for centuries. Right. So I think the empowerment of the people up there is, is very important. And, um, you know, not, not everyone that lives up there that lives in sort of marginalized communities is, is part of the Nama community or any of the indigenous communities. But certainly they're all interconnected. And, um, you know, that's definitely one of our mandates is to, is to empower the people up there, to give them a voice. Right. Uh, we made a movie last year called Ours Not Mine, which, um, you know, was just a start. That's mm. one of our kind of strategic objectives is, is, is media, is getting mm -hmm. publicity in the media um, through our own productions, for example, our movie that we made. And then also, you know, Daily Maverick, for example, have been really uh, supportive of us um, and ground up and published several articles over, over the last three years and quite a spate of them recently. And, uh, you know, we won't take complete credit to drawing the attention to the situation up there uh, for our efforts alone. There are a lot of other people that have been putting in a lot of work um, mm -hmm. There's a, a professor from UCT called Mel Soman who's been working up there for a long time. Suzanne du Duplessis, a number of other people who are affiliated with our organisation, but they're not, you know, uh, active members uh, that have been doing a lot of work as well. And um, so we've been successful in terms of our objective of connecting all these disparate activists right. and 
people that have been, you know, and, and we've connected everyone uh, in a way that they've never been connected mm. before. And then also drawn attention to the, um, to the situation, not just uh, regionally or, or nationally, but also internationally. Um, you know, we've had, had coverage in um, some overseas uh, outlets. One of our objectives right now is to get more coverage. Right. And also using the, the Nama, the plight of the Nama people, and, and particularly the people in the Ruchtersfeld, mm -hmm. who've been um, sort of shafted by uh, an agreement that was made. I, I, I don't want to say too much, just mm -hmm. say the wrong thing. I'm just sort of starting Not to get my, my nose into the, all, the, all the documents that have been sent to me. But, but certainly right. there's, you know, they have not been treated well and um you know just to give them more say over their land because they've sort of been ignored over the years um right the other the other process that's you know part of our um our, our arsenal is what they call the public participation process so basically when whenever there's a, a, a the, the mining process takes takes three stages uh, there's a kind of reconnaissance stage, and then there's a, 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 a stage where they go and um, they prospect. Mm -hmm. So they'll go into an area that they've identified as a potential um, uh, for potential mining, and they'll go and, and just uh, dig boreholes, dig small holes, and and uh, and analyze the the uh, the sand or the ground to see if there's enough minerals there to to justify. A high, you know, high enough percentage of minerals there to justify actually full blown mining. Right. Once they pass that stage, and they apply for a mining license, and so there's these three stages, um, and and throughout the process is what's known as public participation process, whereby uh, uh, stakeholders called interested and affected parties are um, given a window to object, and so we in in many cases we object. Uh, as an organization and we, mm -hmm. we, we, we scrutinize the environmental impacts these guys um, uh, um, uh, submit. Right. Well, there was a case recently where it was determined that the people that were um, compiling, it's on Daily Maverick, the article, compiling these um, environmental uh, assessments were not qualified to do so. Mm -hmm. There was another case where they um, determined that the environmental impact assessment documents that, 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 that submitted for, uh, I can't recall if it was for an application for prospecting or mining, but certainly uh, one of the two, that uh, they'd cut and paste documents from like eight years before. They hadn't actually done any fresh work. Right. Wow. And they've been getting away with this for a long time because no one's put a spotlight on them. But now we yeah. are, we're scrutinizing everything. Um, so that's the, the one part of it. And the other part mm. of it is just letting the public know Hey, this is going on, and anybody has a right to um, submit an objection. Right, it just can be one line. I, I'm a frequent visitor to the area, and I don't want to see it damaged. Right, uh, right through to what we do is we we, we get experts and anal analysts and, and academics to actually submit like documents, and and we work together with these people to submit coherent arguments against what they're doing. Um, you know. I, I think that, you know, that, again, there's a lot of people involved in the process that are outside our own organization. But, you know, there was one uh, application that was made about two or three years ago where they had four objections submitted. And these are by these people that just, you know, object to everything um, mm. because um, they, they're the ones that know about it. And then there was another one, you know, more recently that had, I think, about 25 people uh, objected and one of the ones that we publicized. Most recently, there was a um, there's been an application to mine tungsten in, near Picketburg, which is you know tungsten mining is uh, very disruptive to the environment mm -hmm. with dust and um, a whole lot of factors. Um, groundwater is another another the use of groundwater and the contamination of groundwater. There's lots of farms around there. We um, we publicised it quite heavily um, in conjunction with an organisation called Friends of Verloren Flay, right. who are you know, established themselves as the custodian of the of the Florian Flay River and the and the Flay down in Ilans Bay, which has been um, practically dry for the last ten years. For some reason, recently it's filled up and it's looking its former self again. But it's it's not only about the water levels; it's also about the contamination of the water itself, mm -hmm. um, and how this will affect jobs. Um, you know, because if the farms fail, then all the workers on the farms and you know, the whole local economy will, will suffer. But anyway, to get to the point, um, they had more than 750 objections. 
which is huge. I yeah, mean, it's like, sure. I, I don't know if it's a record or not, but, but it's massive. And, you know, that was, a, that was a, 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 a combined effort between um, the local activists. There's some very prominent families in the area that have hired these like high, high powered lawyers and advocates mm -hmm. to, to fight the case on their behalf. Uh, and, and those, those individuals, plus the local community, plus friends of Fleur and Flay, garnered the majority of those. Um, but I spoke to the advocate that in charge of the whole process, overseeing it for the community and the local farming um, uh, uh, people. And he said that, um, you know, protect the West Coast publicizing and on all our social media channels, um, got at least 80 or 90 extra applications. Sure. Uh, that's and amazing. They saw, they saw a spike, you know, after yes. they publicized. So, you know, that, and they want to get it up to a thousand now. So that's mm. like a really great example. And obviously that's, you know, it's near Picketburg. It's a much more uh, uh, sort of um, highly populated area, mm. very popular area for tourism, um, you know, strong local economy that's based around the farming. And then obviously the tourism and then, you know, for law and flow, that, that sort of catchment area is just one of the catchment areas mm. that would be affected by this mining. So I think that's drawn attention to the sort of um, community uh, activism and, and together with strong type of sentiment. Right. Um, and hopefully we can continue that effect. You know, uh, obviously there's not as much uh, objections and, and um, the community involvement in a lot of the applications. I mean, they wanted to, to mine the banks of um, the Olifants River estuary. I mean, it's a Ramsar yeah. World Heritage Site. It's like, yeah. I mean, it's crazy, you know. So um, who, who is granting sort of the, the licenses and the go-ahead for this? That's the DMRE, Department of Minerals and Fisheries, whatever it's called. <laughs> right. Have, have you had conversation with them, interaction with them at all, or feedback? We have. We have. Okay. And how is that, if I'm asked, how, how has that gone? I mean, I do understand if there, there's stuff that's sensitive to talk about because the, the reason I'm asking is in terms of tourism development and long-term benefit to the local communities, the sense that I'm getting from our conversation is that tourism would be far better for the economy and the, and the, long, and the environment long-term. It would be a better benefit for the local community than sort of coming in and mining for a few years and then moving on. Absolutely. Um, I, I haven't that been that involved with the, mm. uh, the sort of direct interaction with, with the department. Um, I will say that it hasn't really had any effect. Mm. I mean, one of the long term uh, goals of Protect the West Coast is to create a comprehensive impact, uh, environmental impact study. Right. To really determine. And, you know, this is something that's been echoed by other activists. Um, uh, there's actually a, another article in, on Daily Maverick right now that was uh, published about 10 days ago by, by an academic from UCT about the fact that what they're not doing is not looking at it holistically. Mm. <clears throat> so, excuse me, each of these mining applications in, in particular, you know, the mining applications, they also defend them saying, oh, well, it's not a mine. They're just prospecting. Um, you know, it is somewhat disruptive. Mm -hmm. uh, but the point is, you know, that that it's, it's a stepping stone on the path to a mine. And uh, I'm not sure of the percentages, but a lot of these um, prospecting applications do end up in mining in some shape or form. And so that's the start of it. And then obviously the, you know, full blown mining rights um, yeah. license that's granted to a certain area is starting to enter into with all these um, issues regarding um, disruption of aesthetically disrupting the environment, but also mm -hmm. ecologically disrupting the food chain and the very, very precarious uh, ecological balances that are up there mm -hmm. between not just the land, but also the coast, because a lot of the the, the, the mining that takes place right on the coast, you know, the, mm -hmm. the sand goes into the ocean and causes all sorts of problem problems. And those are very, you know, rich and fertile fishing grounds for the whole of the country. Exactly. So there you is know, a detrimental so. effect, not just on the land, but also mm. in the, the adjacent sea. And I don't even want to go into the oil and gas side of things because that's right. also enormous and the power ship as well. Mm. Um, you know, that sort of falls broadly under protect the West mandate. We're not protect the West Coast from mining. But mining is our focus because, you know, that's something tangible. And there are other organizations that are fighting um, the Green Connection, for example, Right. CER and, and organizations like that that are very uh, active in that space. Um, but we have published some articles on it and it is on our radar as well uh, to, to make sure that, you know, these things, I don't think we're ever going to stop them completely. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the resources are there, um, but it's, it's, you know, mainly for us is protecting the environment and protecting um, the integrity of the local populations to see that they're not, you know, shafted. And yeah. um, again, and, uh, again, yeah. yeah. So, so, sorry, what was your question no, again to go back sorry, to the question? Yeah. No, 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 that's, you know, Miles, what I wanted to ask you, I mean, your, your background is sort of in surfing and skating and, I mean, you know, we we were at school together. You you were a legend. You still are a legend. Um, with, with the surfing, and you know, I think it gives you a very special connection to nature. And I think even for us growing up in Cape Town. But it, why is this so important to you? Uh, two questions: Why is this so important to you? And then, can you give us a little bit of of your background, just so that the people listening and watching can sort of get an understanding and can connect. Yeah, good question. I mean, probably start with the second part first. Like my background, cool. I started surfing when I was um, nine years old. I won't say how long ago that, that, that is, <laughs> but uh, it's a while back. And I, I don't, Let's I don't just really, say it was still in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, just, just in the 70s. I say 1980, yeah. how about that? Yeah, okay, cool, um, sweet, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I can't really remember really where the, um, the sort of trigger for... Um, for the the environmental kind of consciousness mm. that I developed from a really young age, um, I can't remember. I mean, there's, there's an organisation called Surfrider Foundation, which is you know decades old, and it's probably you know I first noticed them in surfing magazines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I grew up surfing in Hart Bay, and um, you know, there's always been pollution issues here. Mm. Uh, you know, with sewage and also oil from the boats and stuff like that so i think it was just really starting to really get a love for the ocean i mean i was started going up the west coast i was 12 years old when i did my first trip up the west coast to ellens bay sure. and so you know i've seen because uh, development is another issue as well you know mm. and uh, i remember going to uh, st Helena bay when i was um you know in my teens uh, quite often to surf and, and the whole point was just this i mean it should have been made in nature reserve. the fact that it was actually made into shelly beach resort Mm. It's a travesty, um, but it is what it is. And I remember, you know, I went to the Navy. And I think I even traveled overseas and I came back and went surfing up there for the first time in a long, long time. And they were digging all the trenches for what is now called Shelly, Shelly, Shelly Point, the resort yeah. there. Mm. Um, and, and just seeing how they carved up the landscape, it really, um, it really, like, it really, it was just something that was just like a shock, you know. And I think probably, you know, as a teenager, I was always aware of, of kind of probably on a, on a sort of subconscious level of, of the, the, and it's always, it's part of surf culture. You know, we surfers are known explorers. We've broken, mm. broken new ground in, in, you know, all over the world. You know, if you go and look at communities that are exposed to the world uh, or even sprung up, um, very often you can trace its roots back to surfing. I mean, Jeffreys Bay, St. Francis area is a prime example. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of other places in the world as well where, you know, they were kind of backwaters and still, until surfers started going there. Is a double-edged sword, you know, the guys bring also kind of Western capitalist, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, pollution and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword. But, but certainly, you know, and, and definitely more recently, um, you know, there's quite a lot of organizations that um, if you scratch beneath the surface, you see that surfers... Um, have been um, either founding the organization or very instrumental in their in their growth. Surf Rider Foundation is the big daddy, they're the original mm -hmm. one. There's surfers against sewage in the UK. And in fact, when um, uh, when I when traveling overseas in the early 90s, I uh, ended up working in Newquay um, in, in Cornwall for a surfing magazine called Wavelength. And um, you know the pollution there at the time was was horrendous and the sewage. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing, you know, um, panty liners and tampons go past me and just raw sewage in the water. Sure. And um, so I made a point. I was the associate editor of the, of the only surf mag in the UK at the time called Wavelength. Uh, and we, we allocated a page to Surfers Against Sewage, which is a very famous, um, certainly in Europe and the UK, a very famous surfer-run um, environmental organization. And their mandate is obviously fighting um, sewage uh, mm -hmm. and ocean water pollution. And they they had they were, they were famous for their activism. They had this giant blow up turd that they took to the to the um, Westminster, and right. they all wore, wore gas masks. And you know they really were quite visceral in their in their protests and quite 
you know, much more on the Sea Shepherd side of things where they, mm. you know, were, were quite activist and kind of punk rock about it. Um, and that was, you know, probably quite necessary at the time where Surf Rider Foundation, a little, a little bit more of a corporate type of um, legal lobbying. And so I predict the West Coast was a bit of a mix of the two. I mean, mm. uh, in 2020, we had a protest up the West Coast. It was only a handful of us that were able to make it up there, but we went onto one of the mines with signs and stuff and makes for great uh, PR. Um, and I always wanted to work for Surf Rider Foundation as well. Like it was, you know, I think go, going to the UK, being directly mm. involved with Surface Against Sewage, you know, and, and making sure that they, every, every issue of our magazine had some coverage from them, uh, which they weren't doing before until I got there. And then um, I interned at Surf Rider Foundation in, in, um, in Australia when I traveled to Australia for a very short while, but it was great mm. to, you know, see their operation and meet those guys. And, um, you know, I think that was the beginning of the, and then obviously traveling, you know, I've traveled to very, very remote parts of Indonesia um, mm -hmm. uh, in the early nineties, um, where in fact, you know, on a Sunday afternoon, um, the people used to come down from the hills to come and look at us because they'd never seen Westerners before. Right. So that gives you an indication of how deep in the jungle we were. Yeah. Orang Puti, and they come and take pictures with us and probably my pictures on some wall in some guy's <laughs> uh, hut in, in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Right. You know, that they came down and, and met us and it was like a big highlight for them on a Sunday to come and meet meet the, the Western surfers. Sure, that is um, so cool. But even then, you know, in the 90s to see that, you know, we weren't immune to the pollution and you'd see rubbish in the water. I mean, Kelly Slater mm. actually just posted something on his yeah. Instagram about it. Sure, I saw um, that. Yeah, in Bali, you know, and it's the, the problem is a million times worse now than it was when I was, you know. Mm -hmm do my thing back in the day. But even in Bali, especially, you can see, you know, the, the intrusion of, of uh, just rubbish everywhere. Terrible. Um, mm. I've been to the Maldives as well. I went to an island. I did a boat trip there um, not that long ago, about eight years ago. And, uh, you know, you go to the, I've done both. I've done a boat mm -hmm. trip and I've done the resorts in Mal Maldives. The resorts are immaculate. But then I did this boat trip and we went to just a normal town the one day. And I, I, honestly, I've got a picture of it somewhere. I took a picture mm. of the harbor. It was thick. I, I reckon you could walk over the, the plastic rubbish. Sure. So, you know, it's always been something that's quite strong. So obviously when um, I heard about Protect the West Coast, and I knew Mike Slebach from, from surfing, you know, Cape Town. Mm. Um, and I, uh, I spent a long time uh, covering um, the big wave surfing at Dungeons for local international media mm -hmm. when, I, when I was a, a surfing journalist. And so I know all the guys, you know, and um, Mike's a great guy and, uh, you know, got talking to him and he's like, we're looking for people like you to, to join our organization. And I was like, I'm all in. I'm there. So it was a great opportunity okay. to take that kind of um, uh, part of me and, and apply it, you know, and mm -hmm. apply all the skills. And I mean, I spent 10 years in the, in the Middle East in a corporate, uh, semi-corporate uh, publishing. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been able to take all the connections and all the skills that I've learned over the years and apply them to, to protect the West Coast. And, and, you know, just going full circle back to the 12 year old mm. at Yellows Bay. And, and uh, you know, I love the West Coast more than anything. We, we, we I go up there all the time mm. and uh, you know, it's heartbreaking. So it's great, really great to be able to take, take that knowledge and experience and apply it in a way that's going to benefit um, the environment and the people up there. So what, what is the objective? What's the, the dream scenario out of this for you? Well, one of the things we want to hope to achieve is to get a, a moratorium that just circles back to what, what I was saying mm -hmm. about the, the Department of Mineral Resources applying all these ad hoc um, licenses without any holistic overview of mm -hmm. the effect that it's having on the entire region. Um, it's all just on a case by case basis. The environmental impacts are very localized. Right. And uh, don't really take into account the, the accumulative effect of all mm -hmm. these mines. I mean, if this latest application to mine this area known as, as uh, well, I can't actually say it's a secret surf spot. Mm. We had a little conversation amongst <laughs> ourselves because this one area is, is, it's not really a secret because, you know, all the pros have been there and it's been in international videos, but it's never been named. Yeah. Um, it's, it's near an area called Karukiskop, which is actually a very, um, uh, a, a area of a great cultural significance in the, in the first nations. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's definitely one of the sort of, uh, arguments in our arsenal of like, look, you guys are disrupting Indonesia, indigenous, um, middens and, and all that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, the bottom line is that if, if we don't stand up and make a noise about this, you know, these, these, uh, so-called secret spots 
nobody's going to be able to go to that. So, right. uh, but yeah. that, that stretch of coast is one of the last untouched areas in the entire coastline from Ellens Bay to the Namibian border. That's not been had the, the claws of the mm -hmm. mining, these miners in it. And, um, you know, if, that, if, that, if those mining licenses are granted, the, basically the whole entire West Coast is one Gone. big mine, okay. which is ridiculous. Have and you so, got, oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, so no. just to go back to the point yeah. about about objectives um, mm. that are over one of our overarching objectives is to um, create a, um, a holistic environmental impact assessment of the okay. entire region and not just right. little individual areas, and bringing into that uh, nature based solutions as an alternative. So all the different kinds of sustainable farming, whether mm -hmm. it's fish farming, algae farming, um, or any other tourism any other kind of sustainable uh, industry or, or economic activity that will bring um, jobs and employment and advancement to the local populations. And ultimately, we'd like to see a moratorium on mining. So no mm -hmm. more stop everything, no more prospecting applications, no more mining applications to be granted. Let's take a step back, look at the, the whole picture, re review the assessment and move forward with, with sustainable solutions. Right. Uh, so that's really the, the kind of first prize for us. And it's going to take a lot of work mm. and a lot of effort and a lot of time to get there. But, you know, we we started the process and, uh, you know, we just need we need support, really. I mean, you know, putting aside the sort of communications um, mm. and all the the motivation, there's there's a core group of about eight to ten of us that are involved in, in Protect the West Coast and, and everybody comes brings different skill sets. Um, and connections and experience to these and we've got academics journalists designers social media experts um, and guys mm -hmm. in the nonprofit sector right. that are helping us uh, to really create um we, we're about to apply for a, a pilot a grant for a pilot project to rehabilitate the existing mines in the northern cape mm -hmm. which will provide employment and skills uh, upskilling of local communities for you know at least three years and that's just a start okay. that's just going yeah. into the existing mining areas and rehabilitating them with natural vegetation um to the point where the ecosystems can recover because mm. at the moment they're just sterile right um, and then take sure. that model and um expand it into as far as we can i mean it'd be great to see every single mine that that's been um that's lying there that hasn't been rehabilitated to get it back to as close to its original state as possible and then obviously any new mines that come along that will be mm. that will be that uh, example or that uh, precedent will be part and it will be policed and it will be enforced right uh, so that's just one of the many things and then obviously you know working with tourism working with local communities to create um to create a, a sustainable industries and economic activity that will you know last for yeah so I think talking on that point of the economic activity, because I think ultimately you would sell the mine to government. This is what I would think in my very naive um, viewpoint on this. You would sell that to government, say we're coming in, we're going to mine, we're going to sell this stuff, but we're also, we're the, we, we want permission to do so because we're going to create local employment and that's going to uplift the community and it's going to develop the community. What I'm hearing, though, just from the discussion and what my sense is that there's no real long term view on that in terms of sustained economic development and sustained benefit from that that economic uh, development or claimed economic development. Do you guys have any figures or any information going back on a mine that was 20 or 30 years old that mined an area, brought jobs and then shut down and left? Has, has there been any sustainable development because ultimately i would think that's what it's for to empower the local community and to enable sustainable long-term economic development for those regions not to my knowledge i'll mm. get back to you on that as far as i yeah. know there's been nothing of uh you know any kind of uh notable impact along those lines um i don't i don't think i don't think there's mm. been anything and, and data is extremely hard to come by right um, I, you know, I, we've I got so. we've got partners, associates of ours uh, in very high, higher in the sort of stratosphere of academia, mm. 
that are trying to get information. I mean, I, I, at the moment, one of my projects for, for Protect the West Coast is to try and get an accurate picture of all the mine, mining applications, prospecting applications, mining applications, and applications that have been approved on those two levels mm. to get a snapshot of uh, where everything's at. And I was in contact with the academic at DCT recently, and they said it's so difficult to get information. What happened is you've got you've got a, a zama zama um, thing happening up in the Richterswald as well, mm, where these mm. uh, decommissioned mines or dormant mines are being uh, these guys are coming in illegally, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, we are about to put out some in the next month or two. We've, we've been gathering uh, our, a team of ours that did a trip up there last year and met some of these guys, mm. and um, so that's going on as well. And um, then there's also, yeah, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, you know, mm-hmm. um, I, I, I stand corrected, but I have it on, you know, fairly good authority that there's, um, you know, basically a lot of, some of these companies, I need to be very careful, but some mm-hmm. of these companies, no names named are fronts for, um, for overseas money. Mm-hmm. And that these guys are, you know, saying they BBBBE compliant and all the stuff they're South African owned, but, you know, they're, they're not. Um, right. And, you know, in the case of the tungsten mine, for example, uh, I have it on fairly good authority that that tungsten they were mined was going straight to the Sultana and straight on a ship and straight to straight to China. Right. So, you know, in terms of local benefits, um, it's very minimal. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would be surprised if there was anything, you know, that showed uh, a, a remarkable or notable positive impact on the local communities. I think it's mostly, you know, n- n- not good for them. Right. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the situation. So how, how can local communities, how can our communities get involved? How can they support you? How can they help? Because you want to be able to take your grandkids and great grandkids to the West Coast. Right? No, absolutely. And you want to, you know, you want to ensure that this this natural resource is wonderful place. You know, a lot of people yeah. look at the West Coast and they see sort of arid semi desert, but the place is, <coughs> excuse me, so uh, mm. ecologically diverse. It's so yeah. stark. It's it's got its own raw stark beauty. I mean, anybody who's been up there, you know, sunrise mm-hmm. on the west coast or sunset on the west coast, or a lovely, beautiful day when the flowers are out. Yeah. Um, and the, the sea is sparkling. Well, and, you get you know, through, and you get to see the sea for the first time. When yeah, you're down just that, that road. feeling of relief, and you know, it's like a, a breath of fresh air. It's just yeah. an incredibly um, beautiful place, and mm-hmm. um, you know, just to preserve that, even if it's not something that's you know, necessarily that you might want to enjoy or take your kids or grandkids to, mm. in terms of the greater community, you know, I think we all have responsibility to make sure that, that yeah. we preserve that. So that's the one, the one thing. Um, but people, we, 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 um, we have a, a mechanism, you know, people can go onto our website and then they can donate. Cool. So those funds go to um, ensuring that the organization can fulfill its objectives. Right. Um, you know, what we, is that website courts. address? It's, um, let me just make sure I've I'm just pulling it up. Here. I'm going to type it up now as well. So, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, so our, our website is protectthewestcoast.org. And so if protectthewestcoast.org. I right. I'm going to pop that up now. Awesome. Okay, cool. And on your socials, does that look good to you? So I spelled that right. <laughs> That's the one. Excellent. Cool. And uh, yeah, we're on Facebook. We've got two mm. two uh, things on Facebook. We've got a page, which is our official organizational page. Right. We've also got a group called Protectors of the West Coast, uh, which is also very active. And that that is largely populated by uh, our community, which is you know surfers and um, runners mm-hmm. and um, uh, environmentalists, uh, but also quite a lot of of local people from the local communities. You know, Innes Bay, Lambeth Bay. Want to clip by mm-hmm. uh, all the towns around there um, that are that are active in there, and that's one of our main communication tools with with the local communities. They're very active on Facebook. We're on Instagram, um, and LinkedIn, and YouTube. Okay. So you can you can go to our website. You can go to uh, the contact page on our website, and all the links are are there. Okay, fantastic. And yeah, to to so certainly you know just from your uh, from the uh, from your desk or from your armchair mm. with your phone in your hand, you can go and follow all our um, all our socials and share right. our posts. Cool. So that was, then, uh, that was the next question. What do you need people to do? So there's donate. There's what do you need from people? 
So there's so the also donate LinkedIn, version. Sorry, so we'll okay. that. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so that's that's the starting point. Is you know um, follow us. Uh, you know obviously mm. when we're sort of presenting ourselves to the powers that be, that the more we have got eleven thousand followers on Instagram, which is which is great. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. And that's largely a result of the international outreach that we've done, and we've been shared by you know a two times world champion John John Florence. He oh. shared our posts on his Instagram, and we got a massive spike of followers from that. So, you know, this is not just a local thing or a South African thing. This is a global thing. There are um, similar organisations in the world, but I don't think there's anything really quite like us. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of surfer and ocean activist-run organisations that cover the gamut of um, activism. Um, from plastic pollution to, you know, um, Hurley, for example, created um, an organization that takes fresh water to um, marginalized communities around mm -hmm. the world. So our, uh, our kind of mandate is, is quite unique. Um, yeah, so, so start by following, following us on cool. socials and, and sharing our posts. We do sort of specific calls to action in terms of specific fundraising, but we also have a number of fundraising mechanisms where people can donate um, whatever they can afford mm -hmm. to us. Um, we have, um, just having a look on our website here, Give and Gain is one of our main um, conduits for, for fundraising. So you can go on there and, and you know, give 100 bucks or 200 bucks or 500 bucks or whatever to, mm -hmm. to the cords. Zappa, Snapscan, PayPal, and then there's also a EFT. You can, okay. all, all, the, all the details are on, um, on the donate tab on our website. Awesome. We're also looking for uh, institutional and um, you know philanthropic philanthropic um, uh, uh, sponsorship or donations, you know, large scale donations from individuals or organisations, institutions that you know um, share our goals and are interested in preserving mm -hmm. the West Coast and uplifting the local communities. Um, and that's something else we're working on right now. And then um, people can also donate their their efforts you know we've got the yes. email address get in get involved at protect the west coast we're always looking for volunteers to help us uh achieve our objectives also looking for sponsors for different um we're about to roll out a whole bunch of um new initiatives and these range from you know the the thing that we're doing in the, at the school in during by mm -hmm. i must uh, just give a shout out to gone gone outdoor and um Patagonia uh, that have that have been quite you know very supporters of, of, of us. Gone Outdoor is, is a South African um, retail store that have, have been extremely uh, supportive of us. And uh, you know we're looking for partners you know to partner with various projects. For example, we're doing a, a giveaway a, a program soon where we've got some local businesses from the west coast to give away, you know, a, a weekend in a in B and B and you know, right. that kind of thing, um, which also is is part of, you know, our kind of mandate is to is to uh, support the businesses on the west coast at the, the local economies there and and you know create employment and stuff like that. So I would say those those are the main the main areas that uh, people can um, help us. You know, if you are as an individual you can donate. Mm -hmm. Or as a, you know, if you have a company that'd like to get involved in, you know, and, and we, we've got everything from sort of smaller scale projects that we're working on um, to, to larger projects. Like uh, we've got another movie project in the pipeline. Right. Uh, um, where where can people find the, initi the, the movie? Uh, so they can find our previous movie, Ours mm -hmm. Not Mine. It's on YouTube and it's also mm -hmm. on, on our website. Um, right. But, uh, it's on our YouTube page. And, and as well as some other uh, smaller projects, movie sort of uh, video projects that we've done, and some um, partner video projects. Okay. Uh, I think if you, get, uh, if you want to watch ours, not mine, I have a box of tissues at hand. Right. Okay. It's a very, very emotive movie. And right. Really, is one of the first kind of um, opportunities for those local communities to mm. to uh, to have their say. Okay. Um, yeah, people in academia, you know, we're always looking for academics and um, people with a great knowledge of um, the fauna and flora of the area to help us. Mm -hmm. We've got some great partners that we're working with, but uh, every day new people are popping up and um, are able to contribute in, in that way as well. Um, you know, we do have events from time to time. We've got some events coming up. We are also going to be launching, hopefully in the next couple of months, an app. Okay. Uh, which is all about public participation. So that's another way that people can, you know, keep 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 track of our social media, 
and our website where we always, as soon as we find out about an application, mm -hmm. we're prospecting or an actual mining rights application, we, we look into it, we publish an article, and we have a call to action for people to sign up as um, into the public participation mm -hmm. process where you become uh, an interested and affected party and then you can lend your voice to, you know, uh, protesting to these different um, mining or prospecting applications. Right. And then, um, yeah, so there's, there's all the different okay. ways that people can, can get involved. The, the people up there, are, I mean, for me personally, I always go back mm. to them because they, you know, I went, I went to just you know, maybe to, to, to round off. Mm. What really brought it home for me is I went up there um, in 2021. There was a prospecting, applica prospecting application um, to mine zirconium in mm -hmm. primarily quite close to Lambert's Bay. And um, there was a public, they had a public meeting further north on the sort of other side of the, of the area that mm -hmm. they, were, they, were, they were looking at uh, mining. But then they had another meeting in Lambert's Bay itself. And um, there were about 150 people there. And um, there, were, there were farmers, there were mm -hmm. local uh, community. There was a, a member of the Khoisan uh, community there, chief that had representing his people. Um, you know, and it was amazing to see all these people from all these different walks of life, all these different social strata in South Africa, you know, uh, with our history and, and the sort of divisive politics that have gov dominated us for so long. Mm. To see all the people come together with a united voice. Right. Um, all sure. firmly against, you know, this mining for all the reasons that I've said, the environmental mm. reasons, the social reasons, economic reasons. Um, everybody has their own reasons, you know, the, the farmers, in, for example, are particularly concerned about the groundwater, mm. uh, beach access for the fishermen, pollution, dust, you know, you name it, um, you know, all these people were concerned and obviously all the environmentalists, they're concerned about the ecosystem, mm. all speaking with one voice and, and very, very vocal against these guys that were standing up there um, trying to, you know, convince the community that it was mm. a good thing for the community and the community were just like, no, we're not having it. So, um, you know, that was great to see. And I think, you know, that really hammered home for me, you know, having been involved in the organization for about a year by then. It's, you know, for, with my own motivations to actually go up there and be in that audience and, and feel the emotion was, sure. uh, and it's in the movie. Mm. It was a really, oh, um, it was amazing. And, and so I just keep going back to those people, you know, and, and, and the environment, obviously, it's important as well. But it's, mm. there's so much potential up there too, and then I think that's right. kind of a good, good way to close off is that mm. that that potential for that region to keep its beauty, and for the land itself. You know, if you go back to the Nama people and the Khoi people, they were practicing sustainability long before it ever became a buzzword. You know, that mm -hmm. was the way they lived on the land. Hundred percent. So we need to go back to that as well. Okay. You know, yeah. and yeah. Sure. Fantastic. Oh, dude. By the way, guys, I just want to mention this took like 500 takes and you can see I forgot to put my tie on. I always do this <laughs> at um, the, these intros at the end of the conversation. So I know what we've discussed. So I think I'll leave this edited on the end. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Love you guys. Please remember, like, subscribe, share and have an amazing day. Bye. Finally! <laughs>